enjoying the view, but for the time being I hope you will look at the screen so that you can follow my presentation. So I will uh, um, introduce to you uh, in the next 15 minutes what's been happening last year. And uh, uh, a lot's been happening last year. I have a bunch of uh, declared interests. I'm the inventor of a number of these uh, devices, uh, but I have no uh, financial relationship with the companies that make them. I do, however, uh, uh, run an internet site called MikeStrictlyAcademy.org where we give trainings and where we will uh, supply the uh, software, which I will introduce at the end of my talk. So one of the most important things that really has happened is uh, 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 in our section of cardiovascular uh, dynamics of the SECAM, uh, we have held a number of uh, meetings over the past years and have come up with this massive document uh, concerning the consensus on the assessment of sublingual microcirculation in critically ill patients. And if you want an update on where we all are, and you can see it, it's an impressive list of authors, that this is the paper that you want to uh, read in intensive care medicine. Uh, there are now about 600 papers which have been published using this technology and about an equal number of devices worldwide. And um, uh, as the technology is now being developed by us, uh, I mean the community more and more as opposed to the industry, I think it will um, uh, gather pace. So uh, in this consensus, uh, it is discussed the, the technical aspects, the difference between the previous consensus and this one, uh, the summary on quality analysis, and uh, most importantly at the end, what we really need for the future. And we're already way uh, uh, into the future in terms of development of the different technologies. So I'd like to review some of the high points in the uh, previous year uh, concerning this. And uh, we did a large multinational trial, you may remember, already in 2050, under the leadership of Christian Burma and Nanke Fellingha, who got their, her PhD on uh, 550 patients included in 36 ICUs worldwide. A one-point measurement. And this uh, study really showed that uh, uh, tachycardia which was really quite, uh, uh, maybe not so surprising, was a predictor of mortality, a single measurement in a mixed ICU population. But if you added an abnormal sublingual microcirculation, you had a very, very high uh, uh, probability of not surviving uh, ICU in this multinational trial. And uh, recently, this uh, study came out from the group of Abele Donati, uh, 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 Claudio Scorsella uh, uh, being the first author, and uh, she just got her PhD, uh, 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 and this was one of the studies. And this really confirmed this in a single center study in which they did a different uh, approach and monitored the microcirculation daily as a form of daily monitoring. And there too, they were able to conform actually that microcirculation itself was a predictor of adverse outcome with a, uh, micro, uh, a microcircuitry flow index of less than 2.6, three being normal. Uh, but if you included the, um, uh, 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 the heart rate, tachycardia above 90 beats per minute, then you really did have a very, very high probability of not surviving ICU. Uh, this is a study by my good friend Nate Shapiro, who you see here. This is when he was uh, much younger, I think, in this photograph. Uh, and this is also a very interesting trial because it was a, uh, a study done as part of the process trial in the United States. And um, uh, in this trial, uh, which was uh, uh, looking at early goal-directed therapy and the effect of that, there was a sub-study which looked at microcirculation. And there they found that microcirculatory alterations was really uh, the only hemodynamic parameters which was actually predicting mortality. So what's interesting about this study is that none of the macrocircuitry parameters was associated with mortality. Uh, but the microcircuitry parameters was, and that was a very interesting, and it was an American study, because there are not many American studies using uh, this technology. This study just appeared this week uh, in uh, anesthesiology uh, by the group of uh, Jacques Duranteau and uh, 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 Jean-Louis Thibault, and this is a perioperative study looking at preload dependency in uh, major abdominal surgery. The interesting thing about this study, it's not an ICU study, and here they found really that uh, a fluid challenge was able to improve all the microcircuitry parameters, as you can see here on the right-hand panel. Uh, but um, uh, on the left-hand panel, you can see none of the blood pressure variables were sensitive to fluid challenge, 
only the flow uh, ones, and also, interestingly enough, uh, the pulse pressure variation too showed a response to uh, a fluid challenge. A very interesting study. It's important to understand that this is in an abdominal, in a, uh, a perioperative setting. In the ICU, however, things are a bit different. Um, what about leukocytes? That is new. So uh, we published a, a paper, which I will just show, but first I have to explain to you what a space-time diagram is. Uh, and a space-time diagram, as you can see here, what is done is you take a blood vessel, you draw the length of the vessel, and then on the x-axis you do the time. So you, each of these dark uh, uh, lines is a red blood cell going along the vessel. And you get these type of so-called space-time diagrams, which gives you a picture of the kinetics of the flow in the, uh, uh, in the blood vessels. And here you see one of the pulsatility in a, uh, a vessel going fast, slow, fast, slow. The patient, cardiac surgery patient, gets put on pump, and you see the laminar flow, and you see all of a sudden the change in the patterns. It's a way, but also the slope of these will tell you the exact speed, the velocity of the red blood cells in terms of distance per time. So we developed this technology and uh, published it in uh, Journal of Applied Physiology last year because you can use this technology to actually visualize and quantify the kinetics of uh, white blood cells. And you see them here as these white lines. And here you see such a, um, uh, a leukocyte going through uh, uh, this corner and we um, uh, validated it in a set of um, uh, cardiac uh, surgery patients looking sublingually after uh, release of the class. Uh, but what's happening now is that more and more uh, measurements are, make, are being made during operations. And we've done now a large number of studies in the last two years uh, uh, during a major abdominal surgery. This is uh, 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 Professor von Eyck looking at the microcirculation of the pancreas, the pancreas tumor. And uh, this is Lucy Shen and Sebra Uz. And we've done a large number of studies in uh, liver resection patients and uh, in specific surgical uh, interventions such as the Pringle maneuver and uh, we've been able to see really abnormalities in distant organs. This is one study looking actually at the intestines and seeing the reperfusion injury after release of the clamp following the Pringle maneuver and we've also uh, been looking at the leukocytes and here on the bottom right panel unfortunately my uh, pointer has uh, uh, deceased but here you can see very nicely that a leukocyte comes along in the capillaries and then enters the, uh, the venules and then starts to stick and roll and you can see because the slope gets lower how the, um, the, the leukocytes progress from the rolling to the sticking part. A very nice uh, example of a leukocyte kinetics. Uh, so uh, this is a study uh, also done by the group of uh, Nate Shapiro using a different technique and now looking at severe sepsis patients and also um, uh, quantifying abnormal leukocyte kinetics. So this is very interesting because it's the only technique which is now combining uh, a red blood cell kinetics with inflammation, actually leukocytes. And that makes the whole environment in which we are looking at a much more interesting from an integrative evaluation of hemodynamic point of view. Uh, the latest device, which is the Bradius device, also has a uh, stepping motor for quantifying the focus depth. And we've always thought that uh, this may be an interesting parameter to use as a way of quantifying a, uh, a parameter related to uh, microcirculation. So it is the depth of focus from the surface of the organ till the place where the, um, uh, uh, where the vasculature is in focus. So uh, what we did was uh, uh, we looked at, um, at colleagues who have specific clinical problems uh, associated with this possible parameter. And we landed up with my good friend, uh, Jan Paul Rovers, uh, uh, who is, um, uh, sorry, here we already could see that in different subjects, just normal subjects, looking at the focal depth here on the right in micrometers, per, uh, micrometers that different people had different focal depths. So, and also depending on where you were measuring in the mouth. So there was a large heterogeneity. The advantage of this focal depth is that you then take one focal depth and then you could do serial measurements without having to refocus. So, so in this study, we went to the urogynecologist. You see, this is a, a, a department where I'm not usually at, but 
This is a, a benign urogynecology. It has to do with prolapse uh, uh, surgery. And, uh, but also, uh, we asked, uh, well, what is one of the th uh, problems that there is? And vaginal atrophy, postmenopausal, is a clinical problem. So we thought that atrophy uh, might be related to a change in focal depth. So we first validated the, um, uh, the methodology by actually taking uh, a vaginal mucosal biopsies and doing histology. And here you can see the tips of the uh, mucosal microcirculation, which we then could put on the camera, uh, in vivo of course, and uh, uh, measure a, a correlation. As you can see, there was a very good correlation between the histology and the uh, actual measurement made by the camera. And this is a, a study done by Michael Weber in my favorite journal, The Menopause, in which we published this uh, particular study. And uh, what was very interesting about this study, so if we took patients that had uh, um, uh, a distressed vaginal atrophy with the clinical features of that and measured their uh, focal depth, uh, we indeed saw that it was around 100 um, uh, micrometers. Normally in age match controls it is around 160. And after three weeks of uh, estrogen, topical estrogen therapy, uh, we were able to see an enormous increase really in the distance, in the focal distance uh, between the microcirculation uh, and uh, the, the surface of the mucosa. A very elegant study in my opinion. What about the glycocalyx? Okay, everybody likes to get a cake, so my good friend Nate's going to give you a fantastic lecture about that. Uh, we've been studying the glycocalyx for a large uh, period of time, mostly experimental. And there are certain, because it's a wonderful world, glycocalyx is like interferon or vitamins, you know, one of these great words. So a lot of things get attached to the glycocalyx and one wonders if it's true. So uh, we try to take away some of the myths concerning the glycocalyx. And one of the things, the unmentioned aspects of the glycocalyx, is that it's important determinant of vascular barrier. Right? I think everyone probably in the room thinks that when you talk about glycocalyx, it's the vascular barrier you're talking about. <laughs> So we decided to test this because the glycocalyx, of course, is a gel-like substance on the endothelium cells, and vascular barrier is something more. It's all the endothelial cells and everything behind that. So this is a complicated study, so if you're interested in this, I uh, advise you to read the study. It's in analgesia and anesthesia. It was sponsored by Fresenius Kavi, who I, uh, I want to thank for their support. And what we basically found in this, much to our surprise, actually, that if you have a sudden type of shock, this was a study we did in hemorrhagic shock, but we actually also did in ischemia and perfusion in sets, a sudden shock. All of the biomarkers associated with glycocalyx went up. So you've got a glycocalyx shedding, but looking with four different types of uh, techniques, we were able to show no effect on the vascular barrier at all. So the vascular barrier was intact. So you could get a disassociation of glycocalyx shedding. Doesn't mean that glycocalyx shedding is a benign surge because all of the physiological functions of glycocalyx, like autoregulation, hemostasis, etc., get lost. But it does not have anything to do with vascular barrier. And in our opinion, the vascular barrier is the adherence and the cadherence between the endothelial cells. But that's a different story. So the last part of the studies uh, have really done by uh, 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 my coworker. Uh, Matthias Hilti, who's sitting right over there. Uh, so uh, I want to um, acknowledge his contribution. He's done great work in the past number of years. And uh, one of the things that he was very interested in was, this was already a concept started by my good friend Daniel de Bakker, on the idea of giving a challenge, a pharmacological challenge underneath the tongue to be able to measure the maximum amount of vasculature which you have there. It's a very important uh, um, uh, parameter because it tells you what your physiological reserve is and it also tells you when you've reached the maximum and there's no point anymore in resuscitation. So we find that the uh, identification of this maximum uh, vascular density is very important and uh, Matthias in this uh, study in uh, intensive care medicine experimental shows very nicely that you can do this sublingually on the right panel and that it has no effect on mean arterial pressure and in fact has no effect either on the nitrates that you can measure in the plasma. So it's a very benign local topical challenge. <clears throat> so uh, this is an example of how it looks like you indeed can recruit the microcirculation and um, 
so this brings us then to the concept of total vessel density that you have underneath the tongue. And it's turning out that this is going to be very important. We're not even talking about profuse vessel density, but just a total vessel density as you are sitting here in the audience. And one such study which was done was done by my good friend here in Rice. They went to Pune, which is uh, uh, in uh, Peru, uh, one of the highest children's clinic which there is, and they looked at babies. He's a pediatric intensivist, and they found that babies born at altitude have got a lot higher density of uh, vessels than do their age match controls in the Netherlands at sea level. So uh, total vessel density is indeed a genetic issue related to environmental, and uh, this was at a high altitude, as you can see here, 3,800 meters. So uh, then Matthias, who besides being a very talented uh, uh, software engineer, is also a mountain climber and went with the Swiss exped, uh, expedition in 2013 to uh, Hinlum, which is also uh, not as famous as Everest, but uh, pretty high, uh, uh, up 6,000 meters, as you can see. And he did a group in Zurich, measured their microcirculation, and at base camp and at summiters. And we found uh, a very interesting fact that actually if you were in Zurich and had a lower vascular density, you were not able to reach the top of the mountain. And that if you had a higher vascular density, you did manage to meet the summit. So your total vascular density was related with your ability to climb to the top of the mountain. At least not ours, but theirs. And so this is a very, very interesting study. So the next question he asked himself, so what about the vascular reactivity? Well, if you give a nitroglycerin challenge to those uh, lower TVD uh, 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 volunteers, they have a much higher reserve capacity, but they actually almost reach the same total vessel density which the summiters do. And here you see the same at the, at the top of the mountain. So it's turning out, also in other disease states, that people who are less fit, as it were, have a lower total vessel density. You can demonstrate that it is so by giving them a challenge. Now this was done by nitroglycerin. We've done it also in gastric ischemia patients, giving a food challenge. There you see the same thing, that there is a lot larger reserve baseline, lower TVD, but the reserve is much larger, that when they get a metabolic, all of a sudden they have to scramble and have to recruit their microcirculation. So this is a very interesting area and this was uh, uh, accepted just two weeks ago in the London Journal of Physiology, which for us physiologists is a very chic uh, 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 journal. Uh, Chairman, I want to uh, uh, finalize with uh, the most exciting, I think, that we have, and that's the uh, development by Matthias of a new software platform. Now, one of the major negative things about the whole technology is the need to actually uh, get parameters, quantitative parameters, using these uh, uh, videos and um, uh, there's a very uh, cumbersome uh, uh, software platform which we developed called AVA which those of you who have done it takes a lot of time and so people are interested in making automatic software however until date none of the different groups or the, the companies involved in this technology have been able to generate and we get these clouds uh, this is CC tools uh, also showing no correlation between the golden standard AVA and the CC tool. So Matthias has been busily de uh, developing uh, uh, this automatic software tools, which we call micro tools. This is our own software, it has nothing to do with the companies. Uh, and uh, if you follow microcirculationacademy.org, you will be able to see its progress. And we can now actually very, very precisely not only define all the vessels, but also um, uh, identify all the uh, microcirculation. I won't take you through, through this. The only thing to say is that we're now looking at distributions of velocities. We can measure space-time diagrams in all the vessels with one step, uh, but we can also do everything in quantitative values of millimeters per second as opposed to microcircuitry flow index. This software package has now been validated in 233 patients with all different types of um, uh, clinical conditions from general ICU population, elective surgery, healthy volunteers, uh, ECMO, etc. And showing in each, done by different groups uh, uh, in the Netherlands predominantly, each showing perfect correlation with the automatic software. And if you look how long it takes to do uh, the total 
uh, a set that's about 404 hours of analysis compared to 42 minutes for the complete data set. So per patient, we're talking about three time points times four videos times these patients. So it really showed. But what's more interesting now is we've got a large database of all of these patients. And we can start looking at what are now the parameters associated with disease and more importantly with uh, therapy. So it's important to remember that there are two important physiological parameters of the microcirculation. One is the, the flow, the convection, and the other one is the diffusion, which is the distance between the vessels. And here we now can see that you can now start to group. These are all the patients grouped together with convection on the x-axis and diffusion on the y-axis. And you can see low cardiac output, like in heart failure, and sepsis distinguish themselves. And that is the baseline. And you can now do a differential diagnosis of a disease-specific uh, uh, condition. But the most interesting thing are the intervention studies. Because if you have a patient that is requiring a uh, resuscitation, he will have a low convection and a low diffusion. And it turns out that if you give anesthesia, like propofol anesthesia, you are able to improve the diffusion, but not the uh, uh, convection. And if you give a patient requiring resuscitation and you put him on a left ventricular assist device, you are very effectively improving the convection, but doing nothing about the <coughs> diffusion. And if you give a sublingual nitroglycerin challenge, then you can see what the maximal component is. So if you're in anesthesia and you're still requiring resuscitation, you know in what direction to go and what the uh, one is. So my last slide is this. Uh, this is in intensive care medicine, my good friend Mathieu de Grand. What is going to be the future? We think that you are, as a clinician, going to have a problem with shock. And shock is a very broad, all your patients in your ICUs are in shock. Otherwise, they wouldn't be there. You will indeed normalize the microcirculation. You will evaluate the microcirculation. And depending on what the status of the microcirculation, you will then apply different types of resuscitation strategies. So I want to thank you, Chairman, for allowing me to give this rather long lecture. But there was a lot that happened last year. So thank you very much.